Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time, Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh. Ever since I heard it for the first time, I've loved that last song, Your Goodness is Running After Me. And it really could be a theme song for the series we're in right now. I want to begin by uh, welcoming those of you who are watching online, our online family. We're so glad you can join us from wherever you are today. But I want to start with this question. How many of you recognize this guy? No, that's not me playing high school football. <laughs> uh, plus, I played quarterback anyway, so it couldn't be me. Uh, this is a guy named Roy Regals. You may never have heard of him, but let me tell you a bit of his story. He's an all-American football player who played for the University of California in the 1929 Rose Bowl game against Georgia Tech. That's probably why you haven't heard of him. He's remembered for just one play in that game. Early in the game, a Georgia Tech player fumbled the ball, and Roy Regals was playing defense at the time, scooped the ball up, and headed for the end zone. Only in the chaos of the play, he got turned around, and he headed toward the wrong end zone. And he ran 60 yards, full sprint, with his teammates chasing him, yelling at him, wrong way, Roy, turn around, turn around. And finally, one of his teammates tackled him on the one-yard line. And the very next play, the Cal quarterback was uh, sacked for a safety by Georgia Tech, and those two points caused them to lose the national championship game eight to seven. And for the rest of his life, Roy Regals was known as wrong way Roy. In fact, if you Google search him today, when you go home, Wikipedia shows up and the heading is Roy Wrongway Regals, the rest of his life. Um, now, we all know what it is to make a wrong turn. Sometimes that wrong turn is unintentional, like uh, accidentally going west instead of east on I-88, which I've done more than once, um, or sometimes intentionally, like when God says don't, and we do. Or God says do, and we don't, like the prophet Jonah. We're in the third week of a series we're calling God in Pursuit. And we've seen so far, as we've studied this ancient book, the story of the prophet Jonah, that it's about a lot more than a man swallowed by a whale. In fact, it's really not about the whale hardly at all. It's a brilliantly written ancient satirical drama, just four chapters, 48 verses. I hope you've read it. If you're not, read it again. It takes you 10 minutes. It tells us that everything is upside down and backwards in the story. The prophet of God runs away from God in disobedience. The pagan sailors turn to the God of the prophet in repentance. It's all backwards, but mostly it's about God. The story's telling us about what God is like, the God who pursues people that he loves, whether they be runaway prophets, whether they be pagan Ninevites, or whether it be us. In chapter one, we saw God call Jonah to go to a place called Nineveh. Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh because the Ninevites are bad people, so he runs the other direction. Instead of going east to uh, to Nineveh, he goes west to Tarshish, to the edge of the known world. But God pursues Jonah in a mighty storm, but Jonah would rather die than obey God and go to Nineveh. So the sailors throw him into the sea, the storm stops, and the sailors who are pagan turn to Yahweh, the God of Israel. It's backwards and upside down. In chapter 2, which we looked at last week, God provides a huge fish. You know, it's the fish everybody wants to know about. To save Jonah. Jonah then prays from the belly of the fish, a beautiful prayer, a psalm really, and he's grateful for God's provision, grateful for God's salvation, and he seems to commit himself to obedience. But he still kind of thinks that God's grace and salvation are just for him, not for them you know, those people. Today we pick up the story in chapter three. I'm gonna read all 10 verses of chapter three and then we'll, we'll dig into what God has to say to us today. Jonah chapter three, verse one. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim it to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. 
A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let the people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn his fierce anger so that he, we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. We're going to see three things. First, the God of the second chance. Secondly, the God of surprising repentance. And then thirdly, the God of surprising mercy. First, the God of second chances. I grew up playing backyard games with friends. Many of you probably grew up the same way. Uh, every day in the summer, we'd go out, my brother and myself, play with the boys that lived in the neighborhood. We played all kinds of stuff. You know, baseball, football, kickball, kick the can. Does anybody play kick the can anymore? We played kick the can. Uh, and when we played these games, we developed a whole set of our own rules. Like when we played baseball, we only had three or four guys on the side, so we played in somebody's backyard. So we declared that if you hit the ball to right field, you were out. Or if you hit a ground ball, you're automatically out because we didn't have enough guys to play the whole field. That was just our rule. But in all the rules we had playing those games, there was one rule that kind of trumped all other rules, and it was the do-over rule. Anybody remember do-overs? I mean, it's like we were playing baseball, and um, you, you go to swing, but the sun gets in your eyes and you miss. You can say, do-over, do-over. The sun was in my eyes. Or you're playing kickball, the person rolls the ball to you, you go to kick it, but it hits a little stone right before it gets to you and you kick a bad kick. Do, do over, do over, hit a stone. Now there were always some kids that took advantage of the do over rule and we would argue about that, but the do over rule was part of childhood. Here we see God gives Jonah a kind of do over, a second chance. And by the way, I think that good old Roy Regals would have wished for a second chance in the Rose Bowl game. Verse 1, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Now, the, the Hebrew there literally says, preach to it the preaching I will tell you. In other words, say exactly what I tell you to say. Verse 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. So God gives Jonah a second chance to obey. Uh, when my brother and I were old enough, our dad taught us to mow the yard. My dad usually mowed the yard. He loved to mow the yard. But every now and then, he would ask us to do it once he had taught us. And when he asked us to mow the yard, he wanted us to do it right away. And if we took a little too much time or we kind of forgot or we wanted to finish our game, and if we heard the lawnmower start up, <laughs> we knew we were in trouble. We could run to him. Oh, no, well, we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. Nope. Once he started it up, too late. And you kind of think that would happen here. I mean, God called Jonah to go east to Nineveh. He goes west to Tarshish, as far as he can get away. God pursues Jonah through a storm. Jonah falls asleep in the bottom of the boat. God makes the storm worse, pursues him even stronger, and Jonah still refuses. He says, just throw me into the sea. Right about that time, you think that God would have had enough of Jonah. That he would have just done it himself, or found another prophet. But God does not give up on Jonah. He sends a huge fish, swallows him up, and saves him from certain death. God gives him a second chance. At this point in the story, if we pause and ask ourselves, what has Jonah learned about his God, Yahweh, the God of Israel? What do we learn about God so far? Well, we learn that God is concerned for Nineveh. Jonah is learning that God loves people that he himself does not love. In fact, that he hates. He's learning that God loves even those who are far from him, even his enemies. And this is actually what Jesus teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. He says, you have heard it that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And by the way, that's kind of a mantra in our world today. Love those like you, love those who think like you, everybody else hate. 
But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. God's learned that jo uh, Jonah has learned God is concerned about Nineveh. Secondly, he's learned that God cannot be escaped. We can run from him, but we can't escape. He's learned that God pursues. He's learned that God rescues those who do not deserve to be rescued because he was rescued. And he learns that God gives second chances. He gives Jonah a do-over, a second chance to obey, a second chance to proclaim his message to the Ninevites. And so let me pause there. Aren't you glad that God gives second chances? Aren't you glad he gives second chances? Aren't you glad he's a little like your mom, if you grew up with a mom and said, if I told you once, I told you a thousand times. Reminding you, no jumping on the bed, no throwing baseballs in the living room. Put the seat down, you know, whatever your mother told you to do. <laughs> there are two great truths in this simple verse. First is God speaks. God speaks. Now you may say to me, well, I, I know God spoke to Bible people. Jonah's a Bible guy. He speaks to Bible guys, but I'm not a Bible guy. I have never heard him speak out loud to me. God does speak. In fact, God is always speaking. According to the scripture, he's always revealing himself, always sharing something of himself with us. The issue is whether we're paying attention or listening. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. God speaks to us through what he has made through creation. He speaks to us through his word, what we open up every week here at Chapel Street. In every service we do, we open up God's word because we believe he speaks. Psalm 119 says, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. The issue is if we are listening, paying attention. He speaks through the Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit who dwells in us by faith and who will prompt us, whisper to our hearts, nudge us, prompt us, convict us. Again, if we pay attention to his voice. Jesus said in John 16, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And God speaks through circumstances. He speaks through the events of our lives. He speaks to Jonah through a great storm. He speaks to Jonah through a huge fish. And then Jonah, from the belly of the fish, finally starts to pay attention and begins to listen. And I wonder if you're listening today. Do you have a habit of paying attention to the God who speaks? Second thing we see here is that God forgives here God gives Jonah a second chance. He gives Jonah a, a second word that he now chooses to obey. Do you know that your sin, your rebellion, even if you run the exact opposite direction, it doesn't disqualify you from God's grace and forgiveness. Psalm 103 says, as far as the east is from the west, and God called Jonah to go east and he went west. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Now, what we don't know at this point in the story is what Jonah feels about this second chance. What he feels about this second assignment was the exact same as the first assignment. Was he enthusiastic? Oh, thank you for giving me a second chance. Is he fearful of the wicked Ninevites? I and mean, they were a pretty awful bunch. Was he begrudgingly obedient? Was he hoping that although God was gracious to him by saving him from drowning with the fish, that he might not be so gracious to the Ninevites? Now, we're going to find all that out next week in chapter 4, and you can read that on your own. It's a very short chapter. That's where John Dixon will be next week when he preaches here. One scholar put it this way. There is no evidence at this point that Jonah felt any differently about the assignment than he did the very first time. Only this time he obeyed. And Jonah's obedience, his second chance, gives the Ninevites a first chance to hear the message. Let's remember just for a moment who the Ninevites were. I mean, Sterling went over this a couple weeks ago. I reminded you last week that Nineveh was a leading city of the Assyrian Empire, which at that time was one of the most powerful and barbaric empires in the ancient world. Uh, Israel's most feared and hated enemy. 
Historians tell us that the great Assyrian king, Shalmaneser III, that's him there. He looks like a brutal king, and he, he was, that he actually was known for commissioning uh, stone carving sculptures that celebrated torture, dismemberment, and worse. If you look carefully at this when you see a captive uh, soldier there in the middle who's missing feet and one arm. That's the story Sterling told you about when he preached a couple weeks ago, that they would take their captives, cut off three of their limbs, leave their right hand so they had to shake the hand of the person who captured them as they bled out. These were evil, brutal, barbaric people. The Ninevites did not deserve God's mercy. They didn't deserve to have God's messenger bring them God's word. They didn't deserve God's prophet. But through Jonah, God offers them a chance to repent. And that leads us to the second point today, the God of surprising repentance. Years ago, while I was in seminary, I had a chance to attend a Billy Graham crusade. How many of you have ever been to a Billy Graham crusade? Anybody? It's been a while since he preached these crusades, but I had been to one when I was like 12 years old in New York City when my parents took me. But this time I was in seminary, I was in my uh, mid-20s or so, late 20s, and I was going on assignment. Uh, I had to write a paper, I think, on evangelism. So I went to observe carefully and to study what a Billy Graham crusade was all about. And I sat really close to the stage so I could watch him, evaluate his sermon, try to figure out what these crusades were all about. Uh, so the crusade was in a small stadium outside Orlando, Florida, maybe 10 or 20,000 people. Um, there were some songs, maybe a special song, and then Dr. Graham stood up and began to preach. He got about 10 minutes into a, what was probably a 40-minute sermon, and people started walking down the aisles toward the stage, streaming from where they sat, second level, first level, toward the stage, and they were just lining up in front of the stage. And I was confused for a minute. I, I was trying to figure out what was happening. Then I realized they were responding to a sermon that, that wasn't even close to being finished. They were responding to an altar call that had not even been given yet. They were coming to surrender their lives to Christ before they'd been asked to. I had no explanation for that when I wrote my paper other than through Dr. Graham, in some way, God was doing something amazingly powerful and people were responding. That's kind of what we see here in verse three. We see, the story tells us that now Nineveh was a very large city and it took three days to go through it. Now the literal reading of Hebrew here says Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Now the word exceedingly is very close to the Hebrew word for Elohim, God. And some scholars point out that this is telling us that not only was Nineveh a large city, it was a significant city. In particular, it was significant to God. God cared about Nineveh. He pursues even a pagan city. And the reference to three days is similarly a reference to not just how big the city was, but how important the city was. Because in an important city, in that time and culture, a visitor would plan on spending three days in an important city. One day to present himself to all the leadership, to the king and so forth. A second day to do business. And the third day, a ceremony of farewell. So a lot of scholars think that's what's going on here. Verse 4, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. So on day one of an expected three-day journey, Jonah proclaims the message God had given to him. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. It's eight words in English, just five words in ancient Hebrew. It's a five-word sermon. No matter how hard Pastor Jeff and I have tried, we can't get our sermons down to five words quite yet. Now, some scholars think this was a summary of the message that Jonah filled in the gaps, said more than this. Other scholars believe this is, exact, this is exactly what he said over and over again. But in this very short, straightforward, five-word message, we see two things that are really important. We see that it's a message of both truth and grace. First truth. In this five-word sermon, Jonah is saying, there is a God. There is a God of heaven and earth, a God of righteousness and justice, a God who is paying attention, who has seen your wickedness, your sin. 
And he's going to bring judgment on that sin because he is just and he is righteous. And this is a message of coming destruction. He's telling the Ninevites, you are people of impending doom. God will say, will do what he says he's going to do. And I imagine, I can only imagine that Jonah kind of enjoyed this part of this message based on how he felt about the Ninevites. He kind of enjoyed warning them, you're going to be overthrown, 40 days, he's going to do it. I'm telling you, he's going to do it because you're a bunch of bad people. I think he was looking forward to God's judgment raining down on the Ninevites. But there's also a hint of grace in this message. Judgment is coming, but not for 40 days. There is still a chance that you can change. There's still time to listen. There's still time to repent. The Hebrew word translated here is overthrown. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown is actually a word that can be translated turned around, turned upside down, having a change of heart. So Nineveh is indeed overthrown, but not quite the way Jonah was hoping. Jonah barely gets the words out of his mouth and a surprisingly weird thing happens. Verse five, the Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest of the least, put on sackcloth. Now, sackcloth was a, like a burlap sack um, that we would call just rags. And in the ancient world, it was, it was a sign of extreme humility. And this is what's shocking here. The powerful and arrogant Assyrians, the Ninevites, are humbling themselves en masse before God. Verse 6, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Notice there are four expressions here of extreme humility and surrender before God. He stepped down from his throne. He left his authority. He took off his royal robes. He forsook his identity as king. He covered himself with sackcloth. He's saying, I'm so sorry. And he sat down in the dust. That's a sign of grief. These are indications of complete and total surrender. And then he issues a decree, verse 7. This is a proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. So Jonah barely gets started. He barely gets to point one in his outline and a Billy Graham crusade breaks out. Imagine if when I told the story of Roy Regals, right then a whole gang of hell's angels came running up to the front and just fell on their knees. That's what's going on here. This is perhaps the most surprising thing in a book that's full of surprises. More surprising than God sending Jonah to the people of Nineveh. More surprising than Jonah thinking he can run from God going the other direction. More surprising than the storm God hurls at Jonah. More surprising than the huge fish that swallows Jonah up. More surprising than giving Jonah that this will be the prophet a second chance. All the Ninevites repent. All of them from the greatest to the least, from the king to the nobles, all the way, did you notice, to the animals. They cover the animals in sackcloth. Now, to us, that sounds funny. Like, who would do that? But if you read the story, this is probably not funny to the Ninevites. They, this is an expression of extreme urgency and fear that the God of heaven and earth is going to judge, and they are repenting. Question, what is repentance? The king says here, let them give up their evil ways and their violence. That suggests they know. They know their wickedness. They know they're a violent people, and they've been proud of it. Now, the word give up here is literally let them turn from. Repentance is turning from sin and turning toward God. Pastor Joe Scavato said it this way, repentance is owning our sin, admitting it, and disowning our sin, moving away from it. But we also need to see here that repentance is not a kind of earning of or deserving God's mercy. It's rather a response to God's grace. 
This is how the Apostle Paul talks about it in 2 Timothy 2. He writes, opponents or enemies must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to, his, to do his will. And I would say it like this. Repentance is both the result of God's grace and the doorway to experience God's grace. For example, Jonah runs from God in disobedience, but in his grace, God pursues Jonah through a storm and through a great fish, and then Jonah turns to obey. It's repentance. The Ninevites are wicked and evil people, and they know it, but in his grace, God pursues them through a reluctant prophet, through his message, and he gives them 40 days, and they respond. They repent. They turn from their wicked ways. Now we have to ask, maybe where does this all come from? Was there anything that might have prepared the Ninevites to respond this way? Well, there actually is some historical evidence that suggests that in the region of Nineveh in that time, which was the 8th century BC, that there had been a series of events happen that in their pagan way of thinking were bad omens, that something bad was coming. Now, there's evidence that there were some small earthquakes in the area, that there was a plague of illness that caused uh, lots of suffering and death, and that in 763 BC, in fact, on June 15th, 763 BC, there was a total eclipse of the sun, a total solar eclipse, like we saw just a couple weeks ago. And all those were omens to them that something was going to happen. And then Jonah shows up with this five-word message, 40 more days and God's gonna overthrow you. So maybe they were primed to repent. And I want you to wonder if you think back over your own spiritual journey, whether there were events or things or people in your life that sort of prepared you in a way to hear God's message, to hear the gospel in a personal way and to respond. And maybe today, maybe now, he's using something in your life to get your attention and to turn your heart toward him. Again, what do we learn about God here? We learn that God is absolutely holy. He does and will judge wickedness, evil, and sin. Now, we live in a culture, we all know, that shies away from any talk about a God who judges. We don't want a God who judges anything. We live in a culture that no longer uses the word sin. But I would argue we all know what it is. We all know what sin is. And people who don't even believe in God secretly wish there was a God who would right all the wrongs in the world, who would especially would deal with those people over there who are not as good as I am. We, have, we live in a culture that believes in judgment, but only of somebody else, not of ourselves. We see that God is holy and he will judge. Secondly, we see that God is also absolutely loving and good and gracious. He pursues disobedient prophets. He pursues pagan cities because God desires repentance, turning. And that leads us to the third point today, and that is the God of surprising mercy. I left home for college in 1974. Uh, I did not go to a Christian university. And so I immediately found myself immersed in an environment that was much different from the home and the church I grew up in. In fact, in some ways, I found myself smack dab in the middle of Nineveh, so to speak. Uh, I was a follower of Jesus, but at that time, I, I kind of kept that to myself. I was sort of a secret or closet Christian. There, but there was a guy on my floor that year named Charlie. And here's a photo of my freshman uh, floor mates. I'm all the way over there to the right in my cool coat and my ever-present basketball. Charlie's way over there to the left, the little guy at the top of the, of the stairs. Um, and from what I could tell, Charlie was uh, pretty much a Ninevite. Uh, he did all the things that I had been taught from childhood not to do. In fact, without going into details, Charlie was probably, at that time, the most profligate sinner I'd ever known. Uh, we weren't close friends, but we lived on the same floor, so I observed certain things. And if you had asked me at that time, hey, could you go share the gospel with Charlie, I would have said, hey, save your breath. Charlie's a Ninevite. 
He's not going to listen. Verse 10, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented. The word means literally moved with compassion and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. We see here that God's mercy is undeserved. The whole story of Jonah is about the undeserved mercy of God. Jonah doesn't deserve to be saved by the fish, but God thinks he's worth saving, so he sends the fish. The Ninevites don't deserve to have a prophet deliver the message of God, but God thinks even the wicked are worth saving, so he sends Jonah, a reluctant preacher, to them. And I wonder who or what did God send your way when you did not deserve his mercy? Was it a prophet, a friend, maybe a storm? Follow-up question, to whom might God be sending you? Who is in your life right now that if, if someone were to ask you, you would say, ah, nah, he or she's a Ninevite, doesn't deserve God's mercy. We also see here that God's mercy is not only undeserved, it's universal. God's love and grace, in fact, this is the message of Jonah. God's truth, love, and grace, and mercy are, are without boundaries. God loves and pursues Jonah in his disobedience, his rebellion. God pursues the Ninevites in their ignorance and their wickedness, and God pursues us. He pursues us when we're far from him, when we're running from him, when we are more like Ninevites and doing our own thing. And when we're like Jonah and we think the Ninevites don't deserve God's mercy, he pursues. I'm gonna wrap by going back to Charlie for just a minute. minute. Uh, I gra we graduated from college and you know, we weren't, well, I wasn't close friends with him and I didn't think about Charlie for 15 or 20 years. And then one day I read the class notes in our alumni magazine that I get like four times a year. And I still get it after all these years. I just read, I read the one class, class of 1978, just to see what people are doing, even though I'm no longer connected with them. But I read through the class notes and I noticed this little blurb that said, Charlie, and I recognize his last name, and his wife have become uh, Bible translators with Wycliffe Bible translators. I was so shocked, I yelled out loud and I dropped the magazine on the floor. I yelled, my wife didn't know me in that time. I said, hey, come here. You got you to you hear about Charlie. So I immediately tried to contact Wycliffe and reach him through Wycliffe. But he was working in an area of the world so dangerous that they couldn't even share his contact information. And by the way, I remembered that he had been an English major. So it made some sense. And then years, a few years go by, and I tried again. This time through email, I, I reached him, and he responded. And over email, we went back and forth a little bit. Charlie, remember me? Yeah, I remember you. How did you get where you are now? And he told me some of his story. And he said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I've been a pastor for many years. And then Charlie said this. I still have it somewhere. I printed it out. He said, who would have ever thought God could use a couple of schlubs like us, he said. <laughs> I think I laughed out loud like, when we were in school, I thought him to be a Ninevite. And he thought me to be a schlub. I think the story of Jonah is in the Bible to help us see ourselves. I think it's in the Bible so that we can find ourselves in the story. And it's possible that in some way you're, you're kind of like an Ninevite. You're here, but you're kind of living on your own, kind of following the way of the world and not really caring about the results. In his grace, God speaks to you and pursues you. He says, maybe it's time to turn. Maybe it's time to turn around come back. Or maybe you're a little more like Jonah. I mean, you know, and you've experienced his grace in your life. Maybe you've been baptized like the folks today, but deep down, you, you're kind of content with keeping that to yourself. That is really for you, not for, you know, them. And God pursues you as well. In his grace, he speaks to you. Maybe it's time to turn and be willing to share that mercy with someone in your life. I think Jesus sort of summarizes the entire book of Jonah in two verses in John chapter three. The first part of, the, part of this passage you're gonna recognize. The second part might be new to you. Let me read them for you with this we close today. 
Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but rather to save the world through him. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord, how we thank you for this strange, surprising, and challenging story. Thank you for being the God who pursues pursues each one of us in truth and grace. Thank you for being a God of second chances. Thank you for being the God of great mercy. And thank you for being a God who speaks. May we have ears to hear and hearts to obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just before the benediction, let me just say this. If today... If you're honest with yourself, you've been walking or drifting or maybe running full speed away from God. And today you've sensed him speak to you, pursuing you, saying, hey, it's time to stop, time to turn. I'd welcome the chance to speak with you, pray with you, and celebrate your decision to turn toward him today. I'll be right here at the end of the service. Let's hear the benediction today. Go now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who pursues us through his love who saves us by his grace and who calls us to share his mercy with the world. Amen.